Let's face it, Heat friends, despite its majestic, ethereal name, Eternia is a creepy bloody planet, isn't it? They are lasers that make people disappear or turn people to stone. There's freaky rock formations that come to life. Sea demons and dragons are a normal day-to-day -day occurrence by Eternian standards. And if that isn't weird enough, well, there's Ram Man. Seriously, can you back off a little bit there? So it may not come as a surprise that today's episode begins in a golden temple surrounded by lava, and it's even less surprising that Skeletor is there, stealing yet another ancient and mystical bauble with some bad intentions in mind. Yep, it's time for another episode of He View, and this time we're going to be taking a look at the fifth episode in the classic series, The Curse of the Spellstone. Let's take a look. Yes, hello all you children of the 80s and welcome to another retrospective look at the classic animated series of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. This was the fifth episode in the series and it was originally broadcast back on the 30th of September 1983. And Skeletor isn't messing about here, he's doing his evil snickering right from the start. <laughs> it better be worth all this trouble, evil in. In a refreshing example of show don't tell, Evil Lynn grabs the glowing yellow ball and speaks an ancient incantation that sends a tornado hurtling towards Palace Eternia. Yep, this is yet another episode that falls into the Skeletor or one of the other baddies finds an ancient and mystical gem and uses it for ill purposes category. And so far we've had the Diamond Ray of Disappearance, we've had the Crimson Gem or the Crimson Pearl, whatever Merman called it, the Dragon Pearl, and now this. Back at the palace, Orko is once again doing a magic trick that backfires. But instead of Duncan being covered in eggs this time, it's actually Prince Adam that proves to be quite the magician himself when Orko botches the old witch hand is the marbling trick. The fascinating thing about Orko's magic is that it almost never works when he's performing for entertainment, but when using his magic to fight against the forces of Skeletor, he does have some successes sometimes. Duncan is wisely keeping away from the magic show this time round and instead is giving a live demonstration to King Randor over his new weather controlling satellite. But the live demo gods are not kind here, as at this exact moment Evelyn's tornado arrives to cause chaos. Adam, my machine couldn't have made a storm like this. But I know of something that could. The Spellstone. Man at Arms takes a wild guess that it must have fallen into the hands of someone evil because, well, that's what's happened in every other episode so far. Nonetheless, the evil magic tornado is Prince Adam's cue to transform into his buff alter ego, He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. By the power of Greyskull. He-Man. Back at the temple, Skeletor is very pleased with himself and with the amount of devastation that the tornado has caused. Soon all Eternia will be devastated and I will reign supreme! So he wants to rule over a wasteland. Hmm, okay. To make matters worse, Evil Lynn disguises herself as an elderly woman in order to sow some discontent amongst the Eternian villagers, who have had to flee their homes due to the storm of the Spellstone setting them on fire voice in the crowd can do more damage than even this storm. I mean, it's not as if these villagers are actually doing anything to help Duncan and Teela put the fires out or anything. They're just sort of standing around, having a bit of a moan. And the arrival of the disguised evil Lynn leads to her rousing the rabble even further, saying that Man at Arms and King Randor have angered the elders of Eternia with their weather satellite, and that the community must punish those who are responsible. The crowd is mostly like, Huh? But she does convince some old fella to fetch the creeping Horak, 
which is reputably the worst punishment of ancient times, but mostly sounds like the nickname of a creepy middle manager who needs to be reported to HR. Meanwhile, He-Man has managed to avoid dealing with Eternia's class struggle by going cruising in the attack track with his buddies Stratos, Ram Man and Battle Cat. They're headed to the region of fire to find the Spellstone's usual home, the Temple of the Fire People, a community that apparently doesn't like strangers. Hmm, I wonder if they have a local shop. Upon entering the temple, our heroes first have to fend off a giant, pink, hungry lava serpent. Now, if you found this video by searching for how to fend off lava serpents, it turns out that electricity works every time. You're welcome. Leave a like and a comment, and do be sure to share and subscribe. <clears throat> anyway, upon entering the temple, our heroes find that the spell stone is gone. Is this what you're looking for? Skeletor! Robots, attack! The flying robots swarm at He-Man, but by now we all know they're really just there to keep the big guy busy so Skeletor can finish doing other evil stuff. Battle Cat is very vocal in this episode and gets excited when he sees one of the robots. Just what I love! A great big toy! And the biggest part of the plot is getting underway. Evil Lynn has led the Eternian mob to the walls of the palace, swearing vengeance on the king. You have brought this curse upon us! Teela recognises Evil Lynn's voice, however, and manages to trick her into revealing her true form. But it's not enough to stop Evil Lynn from unleashing the creeping Horak anyway. Don't use it! It's... it's too terrible! Then why the bloody hell did you fetch it? I mean, it looks like a takeaway box. But then a big black blobby thing appears and chases the royals down the corridors of the palace. Creeping Horak will grow until it completely fills the palace! Things aren't going any better at the Temple of the Fire People. Team He-Man are being kept busy fighting off Skeletor's army of robot knights. Stratos manages to lure one into an active volcano because these things aren't too bright. He-Man alternates between punching them and throwing them. Ram Man utilizes his flying headbutt attack. And Battle Cap drops some science knowledge. There's a big difference between a cat and a robot. A cat lands on his feet. <laughs> Skeletor then distracts them with what's happening at the palace long enough to open up a trapdoor into a cave, which Skeletor then starts filling with water. I think our friends could use a nice swim. He-Man punches the walls of the cave, which do not budge, but somehow realizes that the floor of the cave is hollow. If you can't find a trapdoor, you make one. He-Man uses a giant boulder to make a crater for the water to flow into, and then, somehow, a door to the outside opens anyway. There's even a staircase. <laughs> Talk about fast service! However, the staircase leads directly to Helios, the king of the fire people, and he thinks that He-Man stole the spellstone. We're on your side. We want to find it and return it. Liar! Seize them! There's even a fiery feline to tangle with Battle Cat, and a fiery dragon to chase after Stratos. Why He-Man doesn't just say, Skeletor has the spell stone, I don't know. The He-Man posse is pulling its punches because they don't want to fight, but then the massive pink serpent from earlier in the episode re-emerges, seizing the king in its powerful jaws. However, before the monarch can be transformed into the creature's next meal, the heroic He-Man intervenes, hurling a sizeable boulder directly into the serpent's gaping maw. Liberated from the beast's grasp, the Grateful King is spared from a scaly demise and realises, finally, that He-Man is not the bad guy here. You wouldn't have saved me if you were evil. Go in peace, and may you find the Spellstone. The Royals are sure looking for some of that peace as they flee the creeping Horak, which is still spreading throughout the palace. King Randor comments that they are rapidly running out of rooms, which is probably overstating it because Palace Eternia covers like half of the planet. Man at Arms takes everyone into a special panic room at the back of the palace. I built this hydraulic door to withstand anything. It's our last chance. The Horak doesn't get in, 
but it's knocking on the door, so to speak. By the way, I am a little surprised that at no point have the King or Queen, or even Teela, expressed the least bit of concern about the whereabouts of Adam. This does seem a little odd. You would have thought that at least one of them would have said something. I mean, even if Man at Arms or Orko had then replied with a vague explanation that Adam was safe, it would have been better than them not saying anything at all. Anyway, I digress. Back outside, Skeletor has arrived at the palace and started bickering with the locals. But He-Man is right on his heels, which causes Evil Lynn to get really sassy with her boss. You blundering Skullface! You said you'd taken care of him! In fact, Evil Lynn's got quite a bit of an attitude on her throughout this whole episode, going so far as to suggest that when their plot succeeds, she and Skeletor will rule Eternia together. I don't think that Skeletor's really the sharing type. He-Man and Skeletor had a brief sword fight together. This is actually the only time that Skeletor uses a sword in the classic series, as opposed to his usual Havoc Staff, or that really unusual Magic Wand slash Battle Axe combo that made its one and only appearance in the first episode, Diamond Ray of Disappearance. Going back to the original toy line from the 1980s, the Skeletor action figure had his Havoc Staff and a sword that looked similar to He-Man's. This tied in with what the original pre-cartoon story line premise was, which started in 1982, in which He-Man and Skeletor held two halves of the Power Sword, with the idea that this combined sword was the key to getting into Castle Greyskull. Anyway, this is the one and only time that He-Man and Skeletor both have a sword in the classic cartoon, so we'll quickly move on from there. Although in the 2000X series there was a homage to the original premise by having Skeletor's sword being able to split into two separate swords, and then again in Netflix's Masters of the Universe Revelation by also having the Power Sword split into two separate ones. Right, that's enough of that. Let's get back onto the plot of this episode, shall we? It's not looking good for the heroes, as Evil Lynn conjures up another tornado against them. But the Eternian villagers have finally realised at this point that the whole situation that they're in is Evil Lynn's fault after all, and they quickly gang up and grab the spell stone away from her. A person doesn't need superpowers to be a hero. All he needs is bravery. You forgot that, Skeletor. You haven't won, He-Man! The Spellstone is the only thing that can call off the creeping Horak, and Skeletor commands it to go back to the temple. He-Man has to run after it at super speed to catch it, and then chucks it at the palace to stop the giant blob from eating the palace and all in it. Now's our chance to escape! Skeletor and his minions use this distraction to hightail it back to Snake Mountain, but at least everyone is safe again. Although, those poor villagers still haven't got a home to go to, and I don't see anybody racing at super speed to help them. Hmm. Anyway, the storms are now gone, the skies are clear, and the birds are singing. The only thing missing is a rainbow. Let me handle that! So of course, Orko tries to conjure one up only for it to turn into a cloud and start raining on him. The episode comes to an end, the screen fades to black, and we get today's moral of the story. You've all seen how Orko's magical tricks don't always go the way he planned. Sometimes they backfire on him. The same thing is true of practical jokes. Sometimes they don't go the way you planned, and you or someone else can get hurt. So be sure and think twice before playing a joke or a trick on anybody. It might not go the way you planned and someone could wind up losing a finger or an arm or maybe even an eye. And no joke is worth that, is it? See you again soon. So for today's lesson, Duncan is dunking on Orko for his magic backfiring and the possible implications of a practical joke also going wrong. Man at Arms is like one of those anxious dads who warns you when you're reading books that you might strain your eyes or get a paper cut. And it's got absolutely nothing to do with the story that we've just watched today. But, you know, thanks all the same, Duncan. Perhaps a better moral for this story would have been not to trust strangers. The villagers had never seen this old woman before, and yet they were doing whatever she told them to do without questioning anything. Surely that would have been a better moral, don't trust strangers, or be wary of strangers. Or, I don't know, you don't need superpowers to do the right thing. All you need is bravery. All you need is to have courage. Surely that's the message for kids to take away from this episode. Well, anyway, this was a fun episode, but also 
an overly busy one. As a result, we don't really get to delve into any of the cool stuff that was happening. Like the Fire People, for example. They were an exciting new part of the show's universe, but they were really only in one scene. And I think this is it for them. I think this is, this is it. I don't think we'll see them in the classic series again. I'd have loved to have had a Helios action figure back in the day. That would have looked cool. Um, what's the deal with the creepy Horak? In ancient times, it was used to punish criminals, but the only way to stop it is with the Spellstone, which everyone thought was a myth. And why does this old fella have it anyway? Hmm, bit odd. The Horak might be a massive illogical concept, and it does go on for far too long, but you can't deny that it's definitely scary. It's like something from a horror movie. It wouldn't surprise me if Filmation had been inspired by the 1958 sci-fi movie The Blob when they were putting this particular episode together. But it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a mass that keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's also um, quite amusing that the entire threat is ended simply by having one nameless villager grab Evil in from behind, whilst another takes the spellstone off her. She certainly didn't appear to put up much of a fight. In short, although nothing was particularly special, this was another fun trip to that wild and wacky world of Planet Eternia. Next time on HeView, we'll be taking a trip down the time corridor, in which Skeletor goes back to the past, He-Man trials his luck on the Wheel of Fortune, Orko moves up from dropping eggs on Manatee arms to instead covering him in an entire chocolate cake. Oh god, I hope that is chocolate. Skeletor tries and fails to master the art of reverse psychology, and we get another one and done appearance of another one of Skeletor's minions, this vaguely dinosaur-esque chap who's graced with the name of Fangman, who uh, is somebody else that I don't think ever got an action figure either. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll see you then. Thank you for watching another little analysis slash rant on He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. If you have enjoyed this piece of inane, retro fueled drivel from myself, then please do take the time to leave a like and a comment, and be sure to check out some of my other videos. I have an entire playlist filled with He-Man related content for your enjoyment. Please also consider sharing this video across your social media platforms, in particular with those that have got anything to do with He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and just classic cartoons in general. And do be sure to subscribe to the channel as well to see future videos just like this. But for now, thank you very much for stopping by the Big Daddy D Reviews channel, and We'll catch you again next time.